Associate Dean of Judaic Studies and a Visiting Assistant Professor of Talmud for the Irving I. Stonebay Metrics Program, as well as Associate Dean of Judaic Studies for uh, Isaac Brewer College and Yeshiva University. Ray Rapp is a graduate of Yeshiva College in 1990 and at Columbia Law School in 1995. Prior to that, he spent two and a half years studying in Yeshiva Karib in Yavna in Israel and was ordained at the Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khan at Theological Seminary receiving Yad and Yad and Smitha. Rabbi Rapp is dying at the Beitin of America. He has lectured on a wide range of topics with a focus on the interface between Halakha and the modern world. Today, Rabbi Rapp will be speaking to us about magic and the supernatural or Jewish perspective. Rabbi Rapp. Thank you, Yoni, for those uh, wrong words. It sounded very natural. <laughs> Thanks, Rabbi. Anytime. Thanks for hosting. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit this morning about a topic that came out in last week's parsha, the topic of Kishuf. As the Torah gets towards the end, in the development, there's a long list of mitzvahs, one after another after another, which don't seem to be related to one another, and we kind of run through them. One that's particularly interested is this concept of the Isser, the prohibition of doing magic. So if we just, I put the Pesukim here as number one on the source sheet. It's a long list. You can't be a wizard. You can't do uh, various, you can't uh, work with demons. Long list of different types of magic ones not allowed to do. They used to have different types where they would be able to look into the future, supposedly, or they would take uh, people and pass them through fire. The Torah says, you can't do any of that. Ki toav as Hashem kol osa'elah, v'kala toav osa'elah, Hashem okel v'mosho sambi p'necham. God hates this. Rather, toven t'yeh m'ashem olokecham. Rather, you should be perfect in your faith. Meaning that instead of trying to figure out what's next, trying to somehow go around the laws of nature, the Torah tells us, work within nature, and it'll all be good. Trust God. So, the first question we have to deal with is, is any of this true? Is there a possibility out there to somehow violate the rules of nature without God wanting you to do it? Now clearly we have Judaism believes that if God wants to do a miracle, God can do a miracle and God can allow man to do a miracle. God can split the Red Sea. God can have Moshe Rabbeinu split the Red Sea. That we all agree with. That's another discussion. But what if somebody wants to split the sea? Somebody wants to create a new being. Somebody wants to look into the future. And God does not want the person to do that. Now, obviously, there is a possibility to do things that God does not want us to do. That's what we call free will. God doesn't want us to kill people. We have the ability to kill somebody. We have the ability to steal. We have the ability to do wrong. The question is, do we have the ability, do we have the physical ability to somehow violate the rules of nature? Now, it would seem, based on these psukim, that the answer is yes. Because if there's no possibility of violating the rules of nature, why in the world would there be something telling us not to do it? Right? There's a possibility. There are many, if you ever look at the laws in the books here in, the, let's say, the state of New York, there are many laws out there that are currently not being enforced. For example, there's a criminal, it's criminal to do adultery. No one has been prosecuted for adultery in the last 80 years. One has reason to believe it's not because the people have stopped doing it. <laughs> Rather, it is because that for whatever reason, this is a law that, that, that has, is, is now a step below jaywalking. It's on the books. It's just not enforced. So that's understandable. At one point, it was enforced, and nobody wants to go about the bother, the political problem it's going to be to get it off the books. So you leave the law on the books, and the books law stays on the books. But at the end of the day, it's not being enforced, but it's understandable how it got there. It is impossible to have a law on the books that never made any sense. At some point, in order for the law to get on the books, it had to be something that is enforced. Therefore, the fact that there is a law on the books here in the Torah telling us one is not allowed to do supernatural acts would seem to indicate that there is a possibility to do such acts, and God does not want us to do it. The Rambam, however, rejects this. If you look at the Rambam in number two, he, quotes this, he has this idea many times. This is all baloney. This was a trick. This was something that the previous generations did in order that people would follow them. But in 
in fact, there is no possibility of violating the laws of nature. And the Jews who are a wise nation should not fall for this. Right? A person is not allowed to read, it would seem, their horoscope, not because there's truth in the horoscope, not because you and one-twelfth of the population who happen to be born in your month, it's all going to happen to them today. No, that's not the truth. But rather, for a person to believe this is below our dignity. That is the reason why the Torah tells us not to do it. Not in any way indicating that there is truth to this. And the Rabbim goes on here and explains that, in fact, this was never possible. The laws of nature cannot be violated unless God, on his own, or through an intermediary, decides to violate the laws of nature for a specific miracle. But if a person, on their own, to violate the laws of nature, that is impossible. Now, that's maybe very understandable that the Rambam would take such an approach. However, you're stuck with the problem of what's the punishment for this? <coughs> the punishment is death, which would seem to be a little harsh for being stupid. Right? If you go to, a, to go, you're going, going to have your palm read, you're going to someone who's going to do tarot cards, what have you know, okay, this might not be a good idea, but don't you think that the death penalty is a little much for this? So the Rambam actually deals with this in his Mara Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, you know what? To, to, to look at this shtedr and bow down to it and say, you are God, that's stupid also. Right? It doesn't do anything, but at the end of the day, that's the death penalty as well, the Ravod Right? So this would seem to be, according to the rabbi, a subcategory of idol worship, that even though no harm is being done, ultimately, this is something that we take quite seriously. So the Rambam is of the opinion that, in fact, there is no such thing as the ability to do supernatural acts, unless, of course, God supports it. If God does not support it, it can't be done. And therefore, this entire discussion of the Torah, that a person is not allowed to do this, is only talking about cases where someone's falling for it, which is a serious violation, according to the Rambam, but nothing's actually happening. The Rambam is very much the minority opinion. The Ramban, the Rashba, the overwhelming majority of the Rishonim say that if you look at the Torah, it would seem that there are many, many cases against this. So let's give an example, which happens to be, this was last week's Parsha Shoftim, this week's Parsha Kitetzi, there's a reference to Bilaam. If you remember the story of Bilaam, Bilaam wanted to curse the Jews, right? And therefore, God did not want to curse the Jews, so therefore God took the words of Bilaam and turned them from a curse into a blessing. Now the question is, why did God have to bother to do that? Right? Bilaam curses the Jews, God could can stick his fingers in his hand, ears and say, I'm, la, 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 I'm not listening. And where does there have to be any need to change this? Right? Sticks and stones may break our bones, but ultimately the curse should be worth nothing. However, God feels it necessary to go out of his way and change the words of Bilaam from a curse to a blessing. Now the implication is, were God not to step in, somehow this curse would have worked. Now, clearly God didn't want it to work. So the implication of the story of Bilaam is that, in fact, were it not for that, ultimately the underlying theme is the curse would have worked. There is an ability to somehow to use a supernatural power, even though this is against God's will. Similarly, there are many cases in the Torah like that. For example, Going back early on, Parshas Lechacha. Rashi tells us a story that Abraham turns to God and says to him, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but ultimately I have looked into the stars, and I'm able to see that I'm never going to have any children. So therefore, what's the sense of starting a religion with me? Because this isn't going anywhere. What's God's answer? God doesn't turn around and say, you looked into the stars, this is supposed to impress me. What God says is, no, in fact, you were right, that Avram and Sarai are not going to have children. That's correct. But Avraham and Sarah, meaning we're going to change the names, so they, in fact, will have children. Now, what do you see? Avraham, without the help of God, looks, uses astrology. He sees the future. He's off by a little bit, but ultimately he's right. But we have the same idea repeatedly by Mitzrayim. That that it says that the the uh, 
wizards, shall we say, of the Khartoumim, of Mitzrayim, looked into the, into the future and they said, God, don't worry, Paro, the Jews aren't going to make it too far. We see blood for them in the desert. And then when it comes time for the Chet Ha'ego, the sin of the golden calf, at that point, what does Moshe Rabbeinu say? Don't let them say that. What happens? God takes the blood of the desert and turns it into the blood of the bris milah. That yes, there will be blood for the Jews in the desert, but it's not going to be the blood of death. It's going to be the blood of circumcision. What do you see? You see again, the wizard, the Chatumei Mitzrayim, were right. That they did see blood in the desert, and there was blood in the desert. God adjusted what the blood was. But you see, they have the ability to see the future. When Moshe Rabbeinu first comes to Parah, he takes his staff and he makes it into a snake. He takes the water and turns it into blood. What do the wizards, the Khartoumi Mitzrayim do? The same thing. So the Ramban, the Rashba, the majority of the opinions say, we understand you, Mr. Ramba. We understand that you're a rationalist. We understand that it's hard for you to accept this. But at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is that there is an ability to, to violate the laws of nature. And since there is an ability, that's what the Torah is talking about here. If there's someone does something silly, it's not a good idea. We're not going to put you to death for it. When we talk about the death penalty, we're talking about really doing it. That's the story. So this is a major disagreement. The majority of the opinions are against the Rambam. It's interesting. The Gra in the Shulchan Aruch, discussing the Halachos of Kisha, usually the Gra has very small co co comments. You know, a line here, a line there. It's a very long comment where he attacks the Rambam and says, because he learned too much Aristotle. That's what got him into trouble here. He couldn't accept this. The bottom line is that we, we reject the opinion of the Rambam. And we accept that there is such an ability out there. So how does that affect us practically? Imagine if I got up one morning and I said, you know what? I'm angry at God. What am I going to do? I'm going to violate Kisha. I'd probably have a pretty hard time doing it. According to the Rambam, it would be pretty easy. According to the majority of the opinion, how would I do it? So the Gemara in Sanhedrin has a very key line here to help us understand what's going on. Book at number three, Amar Abaye, Halachas Kishaf and Kihilfa Shabbos. The laws of Kishaf is very much like the laws of Shabbos. How so? Yesh Behem Beskila, Yesh Behem Patra Avalasu, Yesh Behem Patra Avalasu. Now, in general, most categories, most halachas have two possibilities. Mutter Asu, either you can do it or you can't do it. Those are the two possibilities. The halachas of Shabbos, and also the Gemara study tells us, the Kishaf have a third category. Certain things you're allowed to do, certain things you're not allowed to do. There is a third category, a middle category, of things that you're not allowed to do, but if you do it, you don't get punished. Potter of a loss. Potter meaning you are exempt from the punishment, but you still shouldn't do it. So, how, so when it comes to learning about learning about Shabbos, there's a lot of different laws we know what falls into it. How does this work with Kisha? So the Gemara explains as follows. Ha'oser ma'isa b'skila, ha'ochis ha'inayin patra ha'oser. And also then there's a case of mutter lechachilah. So what are we talking about? So the Gemara actually spells it out. The Gemara gives a case. The Gemara case is about a malake kishua, someone who's gathering cucumbers. So the Gemara gives the following case. Let's say I'm standing in front of a cucumber field. And I decide, it's so much work to pick up cucumbers, especially nowadays, it's so hard to get workers, the cost of workers, going to have to cracking down on, on illegal immigrants. I'm never going to be able to, to do this. What am I going to do? I'm going to use magic. So I say the magic words, which are abracadabra. To Jewish, that's, you know where that comes from, abracadabra? That's Jewish. Evracadabra. I will create as I speak. That's one of ours. We did not create a la peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> that's the second possibility for those who are curious. But abracadabra, we say evracadabra. Of course, there's a puff of smoke, as is traditional at these things. And with that, all the cucumbers get together, and they all walk into the, into the a nice deep pile in the corner of the field. Everyone applauds, and they put me to death. Because that is, of course, they call osamaisa. That's a violation. Possibility number two is called ochiz asainayim, grabbing the eyes, which I might translate as <coughs> optical illusion. It's like, right? So I say, same word, evra kadavra. Same puff of smoke, everyone watches it happen, everyone applauds. But then when you walk out to the field, all the cucumbers are still there. 
Everyone saw it happen, but it never really happened. That's Potter Aval Asr. That's the second category. Meaning that you shouldn't do it, but you're not going to get the death penalty. Third possibility is Kabbalah. I use my magic Kabbalistic powers. I don't use black magic. I use white magic. Same words, different words. Same puff of smoke, though, however. And that happens, and I'm allowed to do that. Those are the three possibilities. And, you know, in the few minutes we have, I want to discuss how these three uh, apply to us. Now, if I had to ask the crowd, of these three, which one is the most practical? It's got to be the middle one, right? Right. The, the first one's a, the first one's kind of has the heebie-jeebies. The last one has the heebie-jeebies. But the one in between, right? David Copperfield, he's Jewish, right? <laughs> right? So that that would seem to be a case that really affects us. So that's the question. The question is, when we talk about magic shows, should that be allowed or not? So what would you say based on our discussion so far? Yes. Yes. What? Yes, it's part of us. Yes, you cannot do it. Correct. <laughs> I think that was the yes. Yes, I mean, we're not going to do the death penalty for it. However, magic would seem to be problematic. Now, why would you think that it's part of us? So the Sefer Achinoch explains to us, well, the reason is that if I would somehow magically, I don't know, walk on water, someone would think, well, that guy might be a deity. Right? Again, going back to the Rambam's idea that there's a connection between idol worship and what's going on here, there is this concern that people will see the person doing it, even though he's not actually doing anything, and therefore this people think that this person is some super being, what have you now. So, according to that, one would think that, let's say I got up there, there's a little sign here, if I have a hat here, and there is a rabbit that I'm going to pull out of it, as is again traditional, and there's a sign here saying that, 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 that really, you know, there's a bag behind. And when it looks like I'm sticking my hand in the hat, really I'm sticking it behind, and I pull out the rabbit, I didn't do anything. And then when I pull all the things out of my mouth, whatever, I give away, let's say I at least give away one or two uh, tricks, and I say to you, and you should know, by the way, none of this is magic. It's, it's cool to watch. It's a great trick. But it's not nothing really more than that. Would that be allowed? So Moshe Sternbach, the head of the Aida Haredes, writes to you that yeah, that's allowed. That in the event that I make it clear that I am not a person that's possessing any special powers, or rather I know how to do these cool things, that, in fact, would be allowed. If you look here at number four, and Rav Avadi Yosef has a tshuva against it. Rav Avadi says that even if I give the tricks away, I'm still not allowed to do it. Why not? He said, because there's a different concern here. Right? Let's say I'm sitting in the crowd, and then I see this guy do these tricks, and he says, whether that wasn't magic, this is what I did. The person will think, well, wait a second. Had the guy not told me, I probably would have fallen for it. So therefore, Things that look like miracles can be faked. So when we have this tradition that the Jews crossed the Yamsuf, how do I know it just wasn't that guy from Universal Studios? Yeah, we thought that there was God, and we thought, however, you know, now if this guy can really pull a quarter out of my ear, who knows what else he can do? So, that thought being, so, so Vajra said, therefore, even if you give the tricks away, you're not allowed to do it. So those are two possibilities we have. One is you're allowed to do it if you give the tricks away. There was even then that. There's a third answer, and that is a radically different one, and that is the opinion of Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein, the tshuva that's been printed in several places, however, the Igros Moshe is not one of them, says as follows, that he believes that you're allowed to do it even without giving the tricks away. How does that work? He said, well, we know we have a tradition that Shimshon Samson had tremendous strength. No one ever told me he wasn't allowed to use it. The measure tells us that Naftali had great speed. No one ever told me he can't use it. So someone is endowed with the ability to have very quick hands. Why shouldn't they be allowed to use it? Well, the answer is, well, the reason he can't use it is because the Gemara said so. But didn't the Gemara say, how oh, he's a Sanai, he's part of So Moshe said, no, you're reading the Gemara wrong. He said, I could use magic powers two ways to have you see these cucumbers. One is I can use my magic power and put a spell on my cucumber field. And that will actually accomplish something. Or I can turn around and put a spell on you. Using my magic powers, I can somehow get you to see things. Now, the difference between these two cases is, in the first case, I actively did something. In the second case, I didn't accomplish anything. Nothing has changed. 
So therefore, that's the reason why I'm going to get killed for the first one, but not for the second one, but I shouldn't have done it. However, this, what we're talking about here, we're not using any magical powers, right? Not on the cucumbers, not on the person. But Moshe said that's absolutely allowed. There's nothing to talk about. It's interesting. There's an apocryphal story that goes around yeshiva, which is a little bit like this. It somewhat can be confirmed. That when Rabbi Baruch Simon was in 10th grade, he was in with a fellow who was, I believe it was Ari Zivotowski, who was uh, doing learning magic tricks. And Rabbi Simon said, it wasn't Rabbi Simon at the time, it was the little bird, said, uh, you know, uh, you should really be careful that according to Rabbi Adam, they said, they decided to go see Rabbi Salvation for about us. At least. 10th graders from MTA get an appointment to meet with the Rav, and they sit down with him, and they say, listen, you know, you got the magic tricks without a problem. He said, I don't understand. Show me what is these magic tricks. Okay. Pick up deck of cards. Okay, Rav, pick a card, any card. Put it in, don't tell me where it is. <laughs> and then they pull the quarter out of his ear. I'm not sure exactly what they did. <laughs> and uh, there are Salvechik said, ah, this is not magic. There's no problem here. So one could assume, again, this might be a little bit of a leap, but that he, remember, salvation likely was only from Moshe Feinstein. That in order for there to be some sort of iser, you need to have something, some sort of supernatural act. A mere, you know, sleight of hand, that's not a problem at all. So again, you have here a real spectrum. On the one end of the spectrum, you have Rav Moshe, perhaps, Rav Salvation, who's saying that, that magic is absolutely allowed. On the other end, you have Rav Vadi Yosef, that no matter what, it's absolutely not allowed. And in the middle opinion of a stern book that it depends. Did you call this is you call the magician or the audience? Or both? Magician. Now again, as far as the audience, that may be a Messiah they have over a Vera, that may be a listening either, but if I wasn't watching, he wouldn't be doing it. Right, so that would be the uh, audience connection to it. So that's it, it's very interesting. It's, this is now the bad joke time. That uh, Rav Vosner has a chuva where he says that he wants to know whether you can put on a magic show for children. It's a similar, it's a similar thing. So he was very opposed to it. He said, because, you know, children tend to be more gullible in general. So ultimately, he postulates like the rabbit, that tricks are not for kids. <laughs> <laughs> that was the bad joke. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> so that's the middle category. How about the first and the last categories? How did they fit into this? So, we'll say, so as we said earlier on, According to the opinions that disagree with the Rambam, which are the majority of the opinions, if I was a collector who wanted to do every Avera out there, I'd have a hard time with this one. So how does that work out? The truth of the matter is, it's not totally irrelevant. There's a very interesting tshuva from the Binyan Siyam. So that goes around back to, I think, 1840 or so, that the fellow, uh, the Binyan Siyam was with uh, Jakob Etlinger, who was the head of the German Jewish community at the time. He was widely accepted as one of the Boskin Hadar, and also with the Arach Haner, where people might be more familiar with that work. And the guy writes the following question. He said he's very sick, and the doctors in Germany don't have much hope. However, there's a doctor in France that they are recommending that he perhaps see. The doctor is a fellow called Dr. Mesmer, who is, in fact, doing what? Mesmerizing people. Yes, yes, that's where the word comes from. This fellow invented what we call now hypnosis. So, Dr. so uh, they tell him that this guy, Dr. Mesmer, has had a lot of uh, success with, with his work. However, they also add that we're not sure how it works. That from a biological point of view, we can't really explain it. So the question that, that is posed is, well, how is a, is a person allowed to use this? On the one hand, you know, we might find out that this is, of course, some form of medicine, which is perfectly normal, we'll understand it eventually. It could be, however, maybe this is, this is some sort of magic. This is something that we just don't understand. And again, there are a lot of uh, similar examples that are still out there. So, uh, anyone here ever take Professor Silver? Yeah, we got it. No, did. Right? There's a fellow, maybe you heard of him. Chaim Silver, he's on our faculty, and he does this. He's, he started a thing called Torah Dojo, which means he has the ability to sit there and meditate, then he touches the uh, shtetl and explodes. Right? And he can do uh, acts of martial arts that, that clearly violate the rules of physics. So what's going on with that? How does that work? So I remember, I've, I've sat down with him and I said, how, how, how does this work? And he'll explain to you that you know there's a certain amount of energy in the earth, and by meditating I make myself a conduit of the energy, and I focus the energy on my finger, 
court, you that much energy in your finger, and you touch this, how won't it explode? I didn't understand a word of what I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> so what's going on here? Right? Right? Far Eastern medicine. Right? Why does it make acupuncture? Why does it make sense that if I have a stuffed nose, you stick a pin in my knee, it gets all better? Of course it makes sense because there are energy fields and they are kind of the energy is blocked and I don't know what that means. <laughs> So the question is, how do we deal with this? You know, do, do we do we to turn around and say, you know, since we don't understand it, we have to be concerned that it's kinship? Or do we say, no, had had Western medicine begun with the same ideas of, of Eastern medicine, instead of focusing on blood circulation, we focused on energy. Maybe we would understand it. So that's the question. So uh, basically, the Vinian Seum is very make on this case. You know, I was like to say, the, just kind of paraphrasing him. Yeah? But he said, look, his approach is as follows. Let's say I would somehow manage to go back 500 years, right? Get in my DeLorean, get with the requisite amount of gigawatts, and with that I would, would go back in time, and there would be someone lying there dying of an infection of the back. I tell him, don't touch the back. I got these pink pills. Take two of these a day for a week, and you'll be all better. And for whatever reason, they decide to listen to me, and it works. What would anyone say? Magic. Incredible. What's the truth? Antibiotics weren't, weren't magic 500 years ago before you knew about it. Right? It was nature then, and it's nature now. This has been a change. So that's the assumption. The assumption that the Binyan Sion has is that a person can, has a right, when something uh, looks that way, to, to rely on the fact that, in fact, it is natural. One does not have to be concerned in a case like that about Keisha. Interesting, but Moshe Feinstein has a, has a truth on hypnosis. It's a very short tube where he writes that somebody asks the question, again, here it is, or emotion, it's another 90, 100 years later that we're talking about, it's actually twice, right in America, it's over 100 years later, and again, science's knowledge of hypnosis hasn't gotten that much better. And Ramosha just answers that, that you know, Bin and Sien has written his tube, and I spoke to Rav Hankin, and the two of us agree that, in fact, that remains true, everything is fine, there's no reason to change. So. That's the case where it comes up. These, these odd cases of acupuncture, of martial arts, of hypnosis perhaps, etc., those are the cases where you still have run into the question of whether it applies or not. It's very interesting. Um, Diane Weiss passed away in the early 90s. He was the, the, uh, a Diane in Manchester until he moved to Shalim. He had a Haredes, was asked the following question. There was a fellow, Reverend Tony Agupo. He was a reverend in the Philippines, and when he did some sort of faith healing, the person would lie down in front of him, he would have no tools, he'd pass his hand over the body, the body would open up, he'd fiddle around, you know, fix whatever is wrong inside, he'd then pass his hand again over the body, close up with no scar, and he had cured thousands of people this way, supposedly. And the question is, is a person allowed to go to Reverend Tony? Diane Weiss, and then Chris Hitzler explains, and he says, well, you could argue to me, wait a second, you know, this is the same as hypnosis. We don't understand it, and therefore we can assume perhaps that it's okay. So he says, I'm, I'm understanding the whole thing. So let's say we have a new technology. We're not sure how the technology works. And there's a question whether you can use it on Shabbos or not. So do we say, well, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not okay, so let's go for it. That's not our approach. We say, Suffolk Daraisa Lechorba, Suffolk Darabana Lechul. When it comes to Yisak Daraisa, something that is Torah prohibited, if you're in doubt, you do without. He said, I don't know how this works. I don't agree with it. So I think the real answer is that this is where uh, the fifth Chilak of Shulchan comes in. That, you know, there comes a point, there's a big difference between Dr. Mesmer and Reverend Tony. And the big difference is one passes the smell test and the other doesn't. Right? Right? One could look at this, uh, Dr. Mesmer, see what's going on here, and say, hmm, yeah, this, this, this looks right. You know, we might not understand it now, but this, this works. As opposed to Reverend Tony, who I think eventually was proud to be a fraud, I think they made a movie about it, that, no, there's no way. There's just no way this is happening. I think that one doesn't have to assume that they're disagreeing. One is just assuming that, you know, you've got to be sensible in approaching these cases. The last category, as we said, which is allowed, is the case of, of Kabbalah. Say for Yitzira. The Gemara tells us that there are 
right here up shortly afterwards that there were several cases. There's something called the Sefer Yetzirah. We have a, a, the Book of Creation, according to most traditions, it goes back to the time of Avram Avinu. That somehow, this is how you make a govum, if you follow the, the rules here. And according to the Gemara, you're allowed to use it. The Gemara talks about the case that Rava made a golem one time, and he didn't like the golem, so therefore he realized the golem couldn't speak. He said, what do I need him for? He got rid of him. Once we were two uh, Amaroim who on Lotse uh, Shabbos wanted to blow Malka, so they went out and they had a cow. Literally, they made a cow from the Zephyr Yitzira and they ate it. The Gemara says there is this concept out there, there is Kabbalah, which you're allowed to use. And there's a surprisingly large body of literature on this. I remember when I was learning in Cabri Avnes, you know, you probably pointed out, I used to like to sit in the library, and when the new books came out, I'd look at them. So there's, there was a Sefer Minchas Asher who came in, not the one that people know, from a fellow, Asher Amshel Miller. And it was a small volume, 20 troopers, 20 responses. And of the 20, three, two of them involved, if someone dies and comes back to life, do they have to keep the mitzvah still? And the another three of them counted, can, can a golem count for a minute? <laughs> Which I, at the time really surprised me. Like, a full 25% of the book was dedicated to this. <laughs> so, uh, this happened to be interesting. If you ever look at the Sefer, you, you look up and say, well, who was this guy? So this was a fellow who died during the war. He was a Rav in Europe. And he was a Rav in Transylvania. And now suddenly everything made sense. Ah, we have A for a minute, but Professor Frankenstein brought, brought his monster with him, you know. All of a sudden it all made sense. But these discussions, it's surprising. The, the question of can you count for a golem for a minute? I'm not talking about, you know, the six o'clock minute with the ten golems sitting there. I'm talking about, you know, a real golem. That appears in the Mishnah Brewer. Mishnah Brewer, which is a pretty, you know, straight laced thing, they, they discuss the question. Right? And, you know, it's they, just lots. Can you. If you make a, if you make an animal from the safety tier, is it flashix? Can you work with it on Shabbos? You know, the, the, the amount of questions that dealt with is, is very strange. But I think the only thing that's practical, and with this will end, is the is the issue of well, how do we relate to this? Right? It's become very popular nowadays. Rebbe's Kabbalists, you, know, you open up the Jewish newspapers, and uh, among the many uh, ads for uh, for furniture and chosen uh, and kala packages. Sometimes there's an article, but in other times you have these things. It's Sadiq Bali here. Oh, there's a great man coming and he'll he'll cure the sick and he'll make you rich and he'll he'll sing and he'll dance and but you need a shit up he'll make a shit up. You, you do it. How do we relate to these things? Right? They all they all look good. Right? Nice long beards, as you'd expect, you know. How do we relate to these things? How do you know if this guy's for real or not? So going back a good twenty years ago. Same smell test you know, Right. I, I don't know. <laughs> So the question is, how do, you, how do you perform the smell test, though? So it's very interesting. So uh, there's a safer entitled Tomim Tia. And it was written around 20 years ago. The Gedolim got together and they went to the person who was the head of the Kabbalist Yeshiva Yerushalayim. They said, we need a layman's guide. How to deal with these people. And they wrote it. And after it was translated to English, if anyone was interested, Faith and Folly. And uh, basically, there's a bunch of rules to follow. The key one is that no one can know anything in Kabbalah unless they know everything in what's called the Chachmas right? Unless you know the entire Gemara and you know everything that goes along with it, if the person does not know that, there's no way they know anything in what's called the Chachmas, the hidden knowledge. If you don't know the, the knowledge that's out there, you can't get past it. So, so you have rabbis who want to sit down, you ask the guy if he knows the Tosos and Hula, you know, that's the basic rule about it. But even with that, I remember I was bothered by it. So when I was a student back in Yeshiva, I graduated in 1990. The, uh, the uh, issue was bothering me. So, for example, this was this was my question. If my understanding about the way things work is that if I'm a good person, good things ultimately should happen to me. Now, it might not be short term, it might be more long term, but ultimately things should be good. And if I'm a bad person, the opposite. And the fact that you bless me, or the fact that you curse me, should not have any effect. I and horror shouldn't affect me. Right? The many blessings, they should not affect me. So I didn't know where did this fit in. On the one hand, people said, seem, seem to take this seriously. On the other hand, how does that fit into our general philosophy of Skarvonish? So I remember at the time saying that by picking who I'm going to ask the question to, I'm ready to give myself the answer. If they ask a real brisker, they'll say, the old brothers are a joke. 
Right? They ask the Chassidish, and they'll say, because that's because the, the Rebbe is, the question is, I have to decide who to ask the question to, in order to figure out how to get a fair answer. So I said, I was going to ask for a Mayor Torsky. Mayor Torsky is the magic man, because on the one hand, he's a Torsky, a right? grandson of the Torsky Hasidic type. He himself currently is the Tolder Rebbe. On the other hand, his maternal grandfather is of salvation, the ultimate brisker. I figured, ah, he's the man. So I sat there, he was very, very helpful. He's a thinker. So he said to me, first thing he said to me is, this idea of brachas and etc. realize that that's the same question as how can you daven for somebody else? Right? In general, there's a question, how does tefillah work? Right? If I'm deserving of something, just because I pray, why should it change? So a standard answer is because by praying, you know, and connecting to God, and making a statement to myself as well, that I realize everything is in God's hands, so that raises me as a person, and therefore I may no longer be deserving of it. Based on that, there's no way I can pray for you. Because my connection with God, it's very difficult to explain how that helps you. Right? And the Mishabech HaCholah would make no sense. He said, so realize that this is a bigger question than that. That's point one. Then he said, you know what to explain this? I want to tell you a story. Torsky doesn't tell many stories. Again, this is his favorite, though. Torsky says as follows. He said that his grandfather, great-grandfather, that's not what I'm missing, was with Davidal Tolner. He was one of the eight Torsky brothers, one of our great Rebbes. And he said that his grandfather was known as the greatest Rebbe, the greatest Paul Mofes, the greatest miracle worker of them all. He said that one day, Great grandfather sent down his brother, the Rachman Shrifka, there's still our Rachman Shrifka's out there, he came to him and said, I don't understand. For me to do the smallest miracle with so much work, you seem to be shaking him out of your sleep. How does it work? He said, I'll tell you a story. He said, the way things work in my court, in your court, in your court, let's say someone comes there, and right away, you see them all upset, so they bring you in right away. The guy needs food, you give him food, he needs money, give him money. You know, the person doesn't leave until he feels everything's going to be better, if he's taken care of, you really put him in a better place. That's not our policy here. You show up, my, my waiting room is a zoo. And you can sit there for hours, maybe days. And finally, after sitting there, you know, there, there, there's crying babies and screaming. It's, it's a bad one. Finally, the, the, the guy comes over and says, listen, there was a very busy man. You get one minute and that's it. The guy walks in and he starts talking to me. And again, there's a knock on the door, and the Gabe says, Listen, I told you the Rebbe's been married, we don't have a lot of time. Which I mutter some blessing, I wave my hand, and that's the end of it. Said, How do you think the man feels? He said, The man is. I've been waiting all this time, I traveled so far, I heard this guy's unbelievable, and he did nothing for me. Okay, well, what am I supposed to do now? The only thing I can do is I'll pray to God. The minute the guy realizes that, he says, doing a miracle is nothing. So that's the key. He said, the key, remember, is maybe there's a possibility that it works. Maybe there's a possibility it doesn't work. But the bottom line is we know that prayer does work. Right? That we have a direct line. And there's nothing out there that's quite as strong as that. So he says, so that's the key to all this. Maybe the Kabbalah does work. Maybe Kabbalah doesn't work. But even if it does work, you can't be as strong as our own feelings. So it's a message that we should all take now going, we're already into El. Scarily close to Tishrei, keep that in mind that all this extracurricular, extra um, supernatural uh, work, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If we just do what we're supposed to do, we'll probably be pretty set. Any questions? Yes? What about uh, mediums? There are a lot of people that will go to mediums not to perform miracles, but to get messages. Well, so I assume that that would be the equivalent of looking into the future. I personally do not believe that the works, which would mean that it would be not liable for the death penalty, but a bad idea, nonetheless, as opposed to the Rambam, who would think that you're liable for the death penalty for trying that. Becoming up in Rosh Hashanah, what about all the things we do? Like ah, good fish? question. How about tipping the apple on the honey, making the bracha loud and clear? Right? And where does that fit into it? So the Gemara increases, talks about Simon and Milsa, that there is an idea that you're supposed to do things to, um, to, uh, Signs for a good year. So uh, a lot of people point out that, you know, these are just ideas. We, we, we eat sweet foods, we get the apple, the honey. You know, it puts us in a positive frame, frame of mind. We don't believe that it's going to do anything. Remember, Shelton tells the story. If, like I said, if a guy comes home and 
his wife uh, says, oh, I forgot the apples and honey. He'll say, ah, oh, you forgot the apples and honey? Now we're not going to have a sweet new year. This is going to be terrible. He says, so that person not only is a bad way to handle your marriage, it's also <laughs> an iser. Now you're taking it too seriously. It has to be Simone and Milton. They think they say in Mary's realm, they have a tradition that on Rosh Hashanah night, they eat a piece of lettuce, a half a raisin, and some celery. Why? So let us have a raisin celery. <laughs> that, that's right. right. Same idea. Right? That's the rough. It's all the same. It is. That, yeah, you do. So do that, but, but we don't believe that it actually does anything. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay. Back, back to work. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Rad. Uh, I guess stay tuned for the next year. We'll uh, be in touch. <laughs>